Welcome back class, I'm Mr. Teacher with the SAT Math Video Guide, and last time we left off on number 14 of section number 6 from test number 4, so we're going to move on. Number 14 is this pattern, A, 3A, then something, then something, we're, I'm just assuming because there's a dot dot dot. So. The first term in the sequence above is A, and each term after the first is three times the preceding term. If the sum of the first five terms is 605, what is the value of A? So each number is three times the last number. That's basically how this pattern goes, and we need to find the first five terms. So, the next term after 3a will be 3a times 3, or 9a. The term after 9a will be 9a times 3, or 27a. Then another one will be 27 times 3, or it will be 81a. So, now we're going to add all of this together. So, 81, 27, 9, 3, 1, and all of these are just A's, so that's 8 plus 9, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and carry over 2, 10, 12. So 121 A, and the sum of these five terms is equal to 605. So the value of A will be 605 divided by 121, which is equal to 5, which is the correct answer. Now, keep in mind that I have noticed that in some editions of this book, um, even though it's the second edition, like different printings of it, in the back of the book it says the answer is 6, but they later fixed it, so now it the answer is 5. So just keep that in mind if you suddenly see a random 6, then you still know that you got it right. If in the case that you gave number 14 as 5. Alright, triangle time. Let's draw a big triangle, big fat triangle, and go across like such. Q S V P Oh, um, darn. Okay, so let's correct this. This isn't like this. So my apologies. I'm I should have been a bit more careful. It goes like this. This is T, this is R. R uh all right, so in triangle PQR above, line QS over line QV is equ is equal to 1 over 3, and line PT over line PR is equal to 3 over 4. What is the value of the fraction area of triangle PST over area of triangle PQR? All right, so this is a proportions problem, a confusing proportions problem, because it's very easy to mislabel a lot of things here. So let's look at the first proportion. QS over QV is equal to 1 over 3. So QS is equal to 1. Uh, uh, let's use a different color. Let's use green. So QS is equal to 1. Now. QV is equal to 3. However, QS is essentially in QV. So, 3 minus 1 is 2, so the rest of it is 2. So, usually what happens is that we label SV as 3, and that is a pretty quick mistake that nobody really isn't going to notice if you do it. Alright, so the next proportion is... PT over PR is equal to 3 over 4. All right, so PT is equal to 3, and since PR, something like that, 
is equal to 4, then this bit over here is equal to 1. I should have used green. I, don't, I need to be consistent. All right. 3 and 1. So at least you can see what the measurements are. So they're asking us what is the fraction, the area of triangle PST over the area of triangle PQR. So the area of triangle PST, which is this thing over here, will be 2 times 3 divided by 2 because 3 is the base, 2 is the height, and just divide by 2. So this cancels out to just 3. This is the top part of the fraction. So let's keep that separate as our answer. I realize that I always write the answer like slanted. It keeps on getting tilted the other way. But either way, um, the area of PQR is 1 plus 2 is 3, which is the height. And 3 plus 1 is 4, which is the base. So it's 3 times 4 divided by 2. This is equal to 2, 1. So 3 times 2, which is equal to 6, which makes up the bottom half of the equation. So the answer is 1 over 2 or 0 0.5. Either way it works. That's the correct answer. Um, let's do go to number 16 now. Uh, there we go. Let that stay there. So, let the function h be defined by h of x is equal to 14 plus x squared over 4. If h of 2m is equal to 9m, what is one possible value of m? So, let's write out h of 2m. So, we're just going to replace 2m for every x in the equation. So h of 2m will be equal to 14 plus 2m whole squared divided by 4. So this is equal to 14 plus 4m squared divided by 4. You cancel out the 4, and eventually you get 14 plus m squared, or m squared plus 14. Now, m squared plus 14 is equal to 9m, and not um, not h of 9m, but just 9m. So you might be you might notice what the, what the next step is. We just need to subtract 9m on both sides to get m squared minus 9m plus 14, which will be equal to zero. So now we have a quadratic equation. Let me scroll down a bit. So there are two possible answers to this, and both of them are correct. So let's uh, um, divide this into two separate uh, expressions. I don't know. Expand it. Yes. No, contract it. Um, either way. m minus 2 times m minus 7 is equal to 0. I don't I kind of forgot the term right at this moment. It's like a brain fart. All right, so if m minus 7 equals 0, m is equal to 2. If m minus 2 is equal to 0, then m is equal to 7. And both of these, either of them could be the correct answer. So, number se oh dear, that's a big table. Um, number 17, I think, involves clocks. So, a merchant sells three types of clocks that chime as indicated by the check marks in the table above. What is the total number of chimes in the inventory of clocks in the 90-minute period from 7.15 to 8.45? Okay, so let's label the clocks themselves. There's clock A, there's clock B, and there's clock C. Now let's extend these a little bit. So we can sort of label them. Um, let's do this now. All right, so now we divide it to even more uh, sections. So this is the number of clocks. So let's divide that. And this one is chimes n times on nth hour. So basically if it's 
one o'clock, then it'll chime one time. If it's four o'clock, it will chime four times. Um, chimes once on the hour. Chimes once on hour. So chime if it's at eight o'clock, it'll chime once. And finally, chimes once on half hour. So the thirty minutes. Chimes once on half hour. So like four thirty, two thirty, so on and so forth. So clock A, there are ten A clocks, there are five B clocks, and there are three C clocks. Uh, type A and Type B chime end, time, end times on the nth hour. Type uh, C clocks chime once on the hour. And A clocks and C clocks chime once on the half hour. So, we need to find now the number of chimes between 7.15 and 8.45. So, let's first take clock A. Clock A, um, there are two different types of chimes. There's chimes n times on the nth hour. So the hour in between this time is 8 o'clock. That's on the hour. So it'll chime 8 times. And there are 10 clocks. So you will hear eight t eight chimes within ten clocks. So that's the total number of chimes for the A clock on one type of A clock. Well, not one type. Yeah, it is the A clock itself. Okay. So then you add this to another one, which is that it chimes once on the half hour. On the half hour. So there's 7.30 and then there's 8.30. So that's two chimes times 10, which is the total number of A clocks. Now let's look at B. B only chimes N times on the nth hour. So again, 8 o'clock is the only time, and there are 5 clocks of type B, so that's it for that. Now type C, it chimes once on the hour, and once on the hour means that it doesn't matter whether it's 11 o'clock or 4 o'clock or 9 o'clock. It'll only chime once on the hour. So that's 1 times the number of clocks, which is 3, or just 3, really. And then it chimes once on the half hour. So it chimes 2 times since there are 2 half hours and there are 3 clocks. So let's uh, solve it. 8 times 10 is equal to 80 plus 2 times 10, which is equal to 20. 8 times 5 is equal to 40. And 3, no, 1 times 3 plus 2 times 3 is equal to 3 plus 6. So this is equal to 100. This is equal to 40 again. This is equal to 9. And therefore, our answer is a total of 149 chimes. And that's the correct answer. And I would say that shop is pretty loud considering the amount of chimes. So now we move on to the final question of this section. So there are these boxes containing symbols. Let me draw them out. So once we're done with this, I believe there's only one more section of test number four. After that, we will be moving on to test number five. And I am attempting to do these as fast as possible because I have some projects in mind, which I really can't start until I finish this. So I'm eager to finish this and get started on other stuff. So if the five cards shown above are placed in a row, so that the shaded, completely shaded block is never at either end. How many different arrangements are possible? So this one can never be at either end. So what are the different combinations if you want, if you don't want that at either end? So, okay, so there are, let me draw these. Actually, I used a square already. So let's use these circles as placeholders. 
Okay, so this can this thing cannot be at either edge. So for the first edge, we have already eliminated one block. So there are four possibilities. It can be either one of the other four. Now let's look at the other edge, which is all the way over here. We're already using one of any of these blocks for the first edge. And we're, we can't use this one for this edge as well. So that eliminates two. And we're left with three possibilities. And now there are three blocks left to insert. Now this block can be placed anywhere between these three possible locations. So there are three possibilities for the first one. And then there are two left, so two possibilities for this one. And then the final block goes here. So it's four times three times two times one times three. So let's break it down. Twelve times... 2 times 1 is 2, so let's just do this. 12 times 6, which is equal to 72. There are 72 different arrangements possible. So, that is the end of section 6. I will be moving on to the next section, which is section 9, um, perhaps tomorrow or so. So, expect the video by evening or so. I hope this helped you with your math preparation and the SAT preparation, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.